Thank you everyone for joining for today's presentation, Careers in Science Diplomacy, Opportunities and Perspectives from the US Department of State. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Abigail Giles and I'm the Workshop and Skill Building Coordinator for NSPN's Science Diplomacy Committee. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Ona Ambrosoit, uh, the Science Diplomacy Committee Chair, and Lauren Wagner, the Science Diplomacy Committee Vice Chair for their help organizing this event. Um, we would also like to thank the Department of State Bureau of Global Talent Management for helping or us organize this opportunity to discuss science diplomacy careers at the US Department of State. And I'd like to thank and introduce uh, Susan Filatko, uh, Nathan Bland, and Saul Hernandez for joining us today. Three foreign service officers currently serving as diplomats and residents uh, at various locations in the United States. In this role, they are working to recruit talented individuals from across the country for career and student program opportunities at the Department of State. And today they will be discussing their careers at the Department of State, other career and fellowship opportunities, especially those with an emphasis on science and science diplomacy in action. Uh, so thanks again for joining us, and I'll go ahead and pass it over to you. All right, Nathan, do you want, are you kicking us off? I can. <laughs> Um, welcome everyone. I, th this is a presentation that we're doing. We're, we're all from the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Global Talent Management. Thank you, Abigail, for that introduction. We three are diplomat in residences. So we're actually foreign service officers, U.S. diplomats, who are currently doing an assignment as a State Department recruiter in our respective regions. So um, as you'll hear about later, Susan will explain more about the Foreign Service. We have different career paths, but we all move around every two to three years. We move from U.S. Embassy to Embassy or, um, or, or consulate to consulate, sometimes working in the United States as we're doing now. I This is my maybe sixth assignment in the Foreign Service. I am an economic coned officer. We use the word cone to describe career tracks. And the economic cone in the Foreign Service, at least, is the one that actually covers the, the energy and the environment and science and technology and health issues for the uh, Foreign Service. So I started off actually in China. I did my first assignment in China for two years, did my second assignment at the U.S. Embassy to the Vatican for two years. Then I was in DC, actually working in, in a bureau that you're going to hear about later that I'll explain more on, called the Bureau of Oceans and in, in International Environmental and Scientific Affairs. And I was working in the Bureau in the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs. Um, then I went out to the US Embassy to Belize for three years. And then I was in Mexico City for two and a half years. And now I'm back here based in New Orleans, doing recruiting as a diplomat in residence for Louisiana. Mississippi, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. And I'll turn it over to Susan. All right, good morning, everyone. We're so glad that you're joining us. And uh, we love talking about the Foreign Service and the State Department. And so uh, one of the Secretary's agendas right now is to really try and bring in more folks uh, with the STEM background. And we'll explain why as we go through this presentation. But for now, uh, let me just introduce myself quickly. I am the diplomat in residence for the Midwest. I cover Illinois, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. I have been in for almost 24 years uh, as a foreign service officer. I've served in seven overseas posts. Um, mostly, I've done three in Africa. I've done Rwanda, Mali, and Mauritius. I've done three in Europe, including Bosnia and Herzegovina, Herzegovina Slovenia, and Geneva, Switzerland, and one stint in Cuba. So there's my seven. And I've also been in Washington a couple of times. And now in my hometown in Chicago, which is great because I, I think, you know, when I was growing up in this region, I did not know about the State Department or about these opportunities. And so I'm really happy to be back here to be able to share this with people from the Midwest because we're looking for diversity of all kinds, including geographic diversity. So I will pass this to my colleague, Saul, and he can introduce himself. 
So hello, everyone. My name is Saul Hernandez, and I am a diplomat in residence for uh, the states of Georgia, Alabama, and Tennessee. I joined the department as a mid-career professional. I worked in information technology before joining the department. I'm a public diplomacy uh, cone or career track officer, which means I do a lot more press and media relations and cultural affairs, academic exchanges and things of that nature. But as you'll see at the end, I, I did uh, get the opportunity to, to do outreach for a lot of our science policy as well. So even though I'm not directly doing uh, a lot of uh, policy related to, to ESTH, um, you are often in a situation where you might be supporting science policy. So very excited about that. If you're interested in connecting with, with your diplomat in residence, as I mentioned at the beginning, we we all we have 16 of us throughout the country. We all are responsible for our own uh, region. So if you're interested in finding yours, you can go to our website, which you'll see at the bottom right part of the slide, careers.state.gov. When you get there, there'll be a, a banner. And on the top right, you can click on about and then click on connect with a diplomat. And you'll come up to this map, it's an interactive map. You just click on the region that you're from and you'll find your diplomat in residence. As Susan mentioned, we are the ones responsible for reaching out to student populations, professionals, anyone in our regions who may be interested in careers with the Department of State to help provide advice and information and hopefully get you to where you wanna be. Thanks all. All right, I'm going to start with an overview of what we are, who we are, what we do. Uh, the Department of State, obviously, we are the United States government's foreign affairs arm. We are serving at embassies and consulates around the world. There are some 275 separate missions, uh, embassies and consulates. And, you know, primarily we are advancing the administration's policy. We are taking care of U.S. citizens who are traveling or living abroad. Those are our main missions. And you can imagine when we're talking about advancing the administration's policy, this includes everything. You know, we have, we talk about regional issues, we talk about, and we talk about science issues. So if you think about it, all the issues that are, you know, any kind of big issue, we talk about energy policy, we talk about things like the environment, um, data privacy, biodiversity, all of these scientific issues, we have diplomats out there talking to other countries about these issues. And this is one of the reasons we are really looking to expand our pool of folks with STEM backgrounds so that they are out there and are able to do these, have these intelligent discussions with other countries. One of the things I want to mention uh, just real quickly, we are actually a fairly small agency. There are only about 14,000 foreign service uh, personnel. And and these are the folks that are working overseas, but we actually are supported by about 10,000 civil service. And I'll describe what that is in a little bit, but civil service typically are gonna work in Washington. Uh, a lot of the policy, they're gonna be the deep policy experts. Um, so these are the kinds of personnel that we have in the US Department of State. We talk about foreign service officers. Sometimes we say foreign service generalists because we also have specialists. So there's foreign service generalists and specialists, and I'll describe the difference between those in a moment. But those two are primarily going to spend most of their career overseas. As Nathan said, you're gonna do two to three years in one embassy, then you're gonna to move to another embassy for two to three years and so on throughout your career. You may do a two year tour back in Washington, or you could be a diplomat in residence like we are, um, but most of your career would be overseas. Civil service officers, however, they're going to spend most of their career primarily domestically. Most of our policy offices are in Washington. We do have other civil service positions around the country. We have passport offices. We have diplomatic security offices. But those are typically not going to be policy related. And then we also have internships and fellowships. Um, we're not going to talk too much about internships today, but Saul is going to talk about some of the fellowships that we have, including some of the scientific fellowships that we have. Next slide. So our foreign service officers are going to serve in one of five career tracks. Um, and I'll, I'm going to save economic for the last because that is typically where a lot of our science, uh, our scientific uh, portfolios fall, as Nathan had said. Our consular officers, these are the folks right here in the picture. They are the ones that are, their main mission is to protect American citizens overseas. 
So if there is an accident, a natural disaster, something like this, they're the ones who are going to assist. Um, they will help you with passports. They will help with uh, international adoptions, things like that. They also issue visas, both tourist and non and um, immigrant visas. So that's what this picture is right here. Uh, that's the consular track. Uh, political officers are going to be the ones that are really reporting back to Washington, kind of explaining the context of the country where they're serving. They're going to be talking to people, talking to the government, talking to politicians. They're going to understand the political situation. And they're going to explain to Washington what some of the different ramifications are for changes in the political situation. What does that mean for our bilateral relationship? Um, they also do things like write the human rights report, which every embassy has to do. So that's the political officer. They're out there. They're the ones that Washington will turn to if they have a question, um, because political officers will either know the answer or they're going to be looking. They will know someone. Uh, they will know. They will have good contacts to know where to find the answer. Um, economic officers do very similar things, but with a more economic flavor or sometimes scientific. And this is where you may have an economic officer talking to folks in a country about energy security or energy diversification. Um, they could be talking about in, in mitigating climate change, things like that. Those are typically going to fall to an economic officer. Public And I forgot to mention, I'm actually also an economic officer like Nathan. Saul said he's a public diplomacy officer. These are the folks that are out there working with the press. They're the public face of the embassy. So they're going to be talking to basically the people of the country and kind of explaining who we are as Americans and our values. And they are doing this by cultural diplomacy. They will bring over cultural exchanges. They do educational exchanges. Uh, and they're also the ones that talk to the media. And then finally, we have obviously with 275 embassies and consulates, we need a management team. So you can come into the Foreign Service as a management officer and kind of work your way through human resources, budget and finance, all of those things. And that's the management track. So as we said, economic officers typically will do the scientific portfolios. Um, and I think probably both Nathan and I have done that as well. All right, next slide, please. Foreign Service Specialists. So the difference between the specialists and the generalists, as the name itself suggests, they have specialized skills. So this is where a lot of our technical folks come in. We have, obviously, with 275 embassies, we have a huge IT platform. So we hire IT folks. We hire IT managers. We have an entire law enforcement arm called diplomatic security. So we hire federal law enforcement agents. Um, we also hire specialists in administration to do human resources or budget and finance. And the difference between this and the management officer is that if you're hired as a specialist for human resources, that's all you will do in your career. You will, you know, again, you're gonna be moving from embassy to embassy as a specialist, but you will always be doing human resources. Whereas a management officer will probably start out, maybe do one tour as human resources, one tour as budget, ultimately working their way up to oversee the management of the whole embassy. Um, we hire engineers. We're building embassies. We are upgrading, updating embassies, so we hire engineers. Uh, we hire facilities managers because somebody needs to maintain these facilities. Um, and then medicine and health. A lot of times we work in places where the healthcare system is not, is not as good as it is here. So we will sometimes have our own doctors at the embassy. We hire nurse practitioners. We hire physician's assistants, and they will be primary care providers for the embassy community in certain embassies around the world. And then finally, we also have resource centers at some, in some embassies. So we will hire educational and cultural affairs people. We hire, um, we hire librarians to run resource centers. We hire folks to do English language programming in countries where English is not the native language. So there's a little bit of everything, but these are the specialists. Next slide. Uh, just really briefly, the Consular Fellows Program, this is a program intended to help us in places where we have a real backlog of visa interviewing. Um, so this is a temporary program. It's a limited five-year appointment that brings in people with these language skills, Arabic, Mandarin, Portuguese, or Spanish, to serve as a consular officer for five years. Next slide. Civil service. 
Now, this is where I really want to talk to you about. This is these are the folks that are primarily in Washington, although we do have passport offices and diplomatic security offices and some other offices around the country. But this is where we hire policy experts. You are going to, and this is where we really are looking for STEM majors as well. We want them both in the Foreign Service as an economic officer, as a generalist, but we're also looking for folks with very specialized knowledge to work in the civil service and help work with the policymakers on policy because we don't have the expertise ourselves in a lot of these. So we are looking for folks who are specialists in particular STEM fields. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the offices that we have, but you know they they run the gamut. We have a data, we have a cyber and data policy office. We have an environment office. We have an energy bureau. So this is where we're looking for this deep expertise. Next, all right. So who are we hiring? Uh, all of our jobs require U.S. citizenship, so that is kind of the bottom line for that. Um, to be a foreign service officer. You have to be between 20 and 59 because we have a mandatory retirement age of 65, and that's mandated by Congress. Uh, for diplomatic security agents, that's the, the federal law enforcement arm of the State Department, there is an upper age limit of 36 for that one. For specialists, obviously, they're going to need specialized knowledge. Uh, IT folks are going to need certificates. Obviously, engineers need engineering degrees and some work experience. Um, for the civil service, these are going to be specific positions advertised where they're going to be looking for a certain amount of work experience or a certain degree. So they're going to be very, each of the civil service positions are going to be very specific in what they're looking for in terms of background. Next slide. So how do you find out about these? So the foreign service officer, or the foreign service generalist, this is, we bring people in in a cohort and we're hiring many people every year. And the way it starts is with the Foreign Service Officer Test. It is offered three times a year, February, June, and October. And at the time of the test, you're going to register for the test and you submit an application. And that kicks off the whole process. It is a lengthy process to come in as a Foreign Service Officer because there's a testing process. There is uh, an oral assessment as well, which is kind of a day long series of exercises, group exercises, individual exercises. And then there's a medical clearance and a security clearance, a background check. So if anyone's interested in the Foreign Service, just know that it is a lengthy process. It can take a year or more sometimes. So if this is uh, an avenue you'd like to pursue, you do want to figure in that timeline in your in your planning. So if you take it in June, you know, you might not have another uh, job offer for another year until the following summer. For foreign service specialists, uh, careers.state.gov, you can go there. There is a section on the top you can click on that says, I think it says apply. It will show you which specialist positions are open at any one time. Some of our specialist positions are open all year round. Some of them only open for a few months at a time and then close. So you can look online to see which ones are open. And it's a similar process to the Foreign Service Officer in that there is a test, but it's going to be a specialized test for whichever specialization you are applying for. So those can also take some time as well. And you also, because for both Foreign Service Officers and Specialists, you are required to be worldwide available uh, because you're going to spend much of your career overseas. That's why we need the, the medical clearance and the security clearance. Civil service operates differently, and we do not hire as a cohort in general. Typically, what's going to happen is, let's say, the Office of Environment, Oceans Environments, they are going to look for an environmental expert. They're going to submit a job application, a, a, a vacancy announcement on usajobs.gov. So this is where you're going to go if you want those domestic policy jobs is usajobs.gov. And you'll do a search under whatever your specialization is. You can type in keywords. Now, obviously, we're not going to be hiring an environmental policy expert every day. So there's a way that you can go on usajobs.gov and set an alert. So when, you know, the kind of job that you are looking for, when that is open, they'll send you a notification. So that's usajobs.gov. So for foreign service, both officers and specialists, you want to go to careers.state.gov, 
to start the process. That's how you register for the Foreign Service Officer Test. And for civil service, you want to go to usajobs.gov. Next slide. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Nathan here. Great, thank you, Susan. All right, so Susan explained overall who we are as, as far as the State Department, the different career tracks you can take between foreign service generalists, foreign service specialists, civil service, and so on. So now we're gonna dive a little deeper into specific, we told you earlier that the economic officer, at least on the foreign service side, we are the ones who, who do most of the science diplomacy um, and technological issues, uh, we, we track those. So we're gonna dive a little deeper into, into that overall bureau. So the Undersecretary for Economic Growth, Energy and the Environment. That is the department within the department that, that tracks a lot of these issues. We call it the E-Family because economics, energy, environment. So we call it the E-Family, right? Um, they cover a wide, wide range of issues. Um, one, one thing that they cover is that they host the Office of the Science and Technology Advisor. Now, the responsibilities of that office, of that, of that advisor and everyone who works with there is basically to try to connect our foreign policy to, to different developments and discoveries that come from the private sector and from academia. Um, some of the priorities that they're tracking currently include like 5G technology, semiconductors, uh, surveillance technology, um, rare earth materials, things, things of that nature, things that are important to our nation's foreign policy and our national security. And keep in mind that everything that I'll speak about from this department is, is going to be related to foreign policy because that's what we do overall, right? We're the US Department of State, we're the lead foreign affairs agency. So all of our science and technology issues that we cover are gonna have some kind of foreign policy angle to it. And that's why it falls with us, right? Um, I told you earlier, I gave you a, a little teaser about the Bureau of Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs. So this bureau by itself is, is the one that has most of our ESTH issues. We call it ESTH, Environment, Science, Technology, and Health Issues. Um, under that, under this bureau in particular, there's so many interesting offices. And, that, and that's where I worked for my third assignment. I was in the Bureau of, of Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs in the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs. And I'll talk about that in a second. But, um, but overall, so if you were to go to our website, we told you already about the website that's on the slide, careers.state.gov. But the main State Department website is state.gov. And if you were to go there and look in the top right hand corner, there's a drop down menu that, that shows bureaus. And then under the bureaus, if you go to the Bureau of, uh, of the E family, the Economic Growth, Energy, Environment, you'll see all of the different departments in there, including OES. And if you go on their website, you'll see all the different offices they have, such as like the Office of Conservation and Water, which which it, 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 it applies our US foreign policy approach to trying to conserve the world's water resources and how we work with other countries about those types of things and how to sustainably manage ecosystems. We have an Office of Environmental Quality that basically works on international cooperation regarding pollution um, and, and, and different treaties that we're a party to re regarding pollution. We have the Office of Global Change, which is basically climate change. Right, so it's the office that works with other nations about how to tackle the issue of climate change, and so they have the lead on all of our foreign policy climate change um, um, policies. Right, we have the Office of International Health and Biodefense. So of course that means how we cooperate with other nations on health issues. So you better believe they were quite busy over the past three years dealing with COVID issues. We have the Office of Marine Conservation, which was our sister office when I was in the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs, the Office of Marine Conservation deals with fisheries. So, so how do we cooperate with other nations to make sure that the oceans are not overfished? And how do we manage I, 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 U, illegal, no, IUU, illegal and unreported uh, and something else fishing. I forget, I forget the other. <laughs> Unlicensed fishing. 
Unlicensed, yeah, unlicensed fish. So, so how do we cooperate to make sure that, that the fisheries stay sustainable and we don't overfish regions? Um, we have the uh, Office of Science and, and Technology Cooperation. They are the ones who, who try to manage how we cooperate with other nations on science and technology issues, basically. They run what's called the, the Science Envoys Program, in fact, and they try to strengthen our bilateral ties with science and technology cooperation types of issues. We even have an Office of Space Affairs, which, which is about how we cooperate with other nations on, on dealing with space issues and keeping um, you know, space diplomacy great and safe. Now, the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs, which is the one I was at, so it's one of my favorite. I think it, it was, besides this current assignment, because I'm, I'm in my home, I'm from Louisiana, so I'm in my home state living here and doing the recruiting thing. This is one of my favorite assignments, and it's tied with my time at the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs. In that office, we were, we were in charge of trying to protect the oceans writ large, and also Antarctica and Arctic issues. So I had, I didn't work on Antarctica or Arctic, um, but I had colleagues who actually had to travel to Antarctica and, and, and do, you know, Arctic diplomacy. And that was, that's just really cool. Like what other job sends you to Antarctica, right? Um, I was in charge of two different um, delegations. So U.S., I was the head of the U.S. delegation to two different international treaties that we are signatories to as a, as a country. One of them was called the London Convention. Um, and London Protocol, and that one dealt with ocean dumping, meaning what we can and cannot put into the ocean as a country, what kind of waste materials you can actually input into the, into the ocean. Um, the other one was called the Cartagena Convention, which dealt with the protection of the marine environment for the Caribbean. So we are a Caribbean nation. We, we, have, we have territory in the Caribbean, and you know we are, our southern border lies on the Caribbean. Um, so we um we we're, we're, we're a party to that as well um and that one dealt with oil spills in the caribbean it dealt with land based sources of pollution and it also dealt with specially protected areas and wildlife as susan mentioned um foreign service officer generalists we we can we can be put into the economic career track we can choose the economic career track as a generalist you're not expected to have uh detailed you know really really precise knowledge about the issues but you have to study up on them and you, and, you, and you have to be familiar enough with them to be able to make intelligent decisions and and be able to speak about these issues carefully so when, when i became the head of that that delegation say for the london convention i didn't know much at all about ocean dumping and i'm talking about dumping things like dredge material um, which, if you don't know, is the material that that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineer has to dump whenever they clear out a, a port or, or riverways to keep it the same depth. I learned all of that on this assignment. Um, things like dredge material, um, ballast water management, like the, the water that people put in ships to keep a ship balanced. Um, even things like ocean fertilization, which I hadn't heard of before that, but, but that's a, a climate mitigation technique where people can dump fertilizer into the, not people, but scientists, right? Ha have experimented with dumping fertilizer into the ocean to, to, to make a phytoplankton bloom to, to sequester carbon from the atmosphere and drop down to the bottom of the ocean and keep it there for years and years and years. That's all, some, that's all things that I learned about in that position. No prior experience, but this convention since it's, it deals with what gets put in the ocean, we needed to know about those things. Now, I wasn't, as I said, I was the head of the U US delegation to those treaties. So I wasn't the policy lead. You know, I, I wasn't the, the technical expert on those issues. I worked with people from EPA, NOAA, the US Coast Guard, the US Army Corps of Engineers, the Navy, um, a wide variety of experts from other agencies, you know, who knew these issues backwards and forwards. But when it came down to the international aspect of those issues, then I was the lead. So when we went to, so first, we would have to discuss various issues and come up with our own US government points of view about what we want to push in those international conventions. 
So it took a lot of diplomacy internally first to get everybody in the US government on the same page as far as what do we wanna push when we go overseas. So it took a lot of wrangling there. And that was part of my responsibility was, was to try to get us all within the US government on the same page before we stepped overseas. Then when, when we did go overseas, it would be me as the head of delegation at the microphone in a UN type environment with other countries and their delegations doing, doing the same thing. And I will be speaking on behalf of the United States about whatever our positions were related to dredge material, ocean fertilization, radioactive waste, whatever, you know. But it will be positions that I had, one, studied up on myself, um, and two, was informed about by my colleagues on the delegation. So that's the kind of thing that, that, we, that, that we do. I did the same thing for the Cartagena Convention, um, you know, related to those issues that I spoke about there in the Caribbean. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to try again, Nathan. Sure. You want me to try to say next slide again? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. <laughs> so science envoys, as I mentioned, in OES, the the Bureau of Oceans and Environment and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs. There's, there's that Office of Science and Technology Cooperation. And I said that they run a program called the Science Envoys. So these science envoys, they are well-established and accomplished people. Um, the program has been going on since at least 2010, if not earlier, where the US brings them on, brings a, a, a new cohort of, of engineers and scientists. This year we had seven um, who are responsible for doing that strengthening of our bilateral scientific and technology cooperation. They, they use their own networks and their own connections and they identify areas of opportunity for international cooperation. And they serve for one year. As you, as you see on this slide, these are the seven that are the current science envoys. Six out of the seven are actually professors from various universities throughout the U.S. And you see the wide range of areas of expertise that they have. So like ocean conservation and marine protected areas. So I'm pretty sure that that person would work a lot with the, um, the offices that I mentioned earlier, like the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs and the Office of um, Marine Conserva Conservation. The illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing that's that's the other one from OMC, the Office of Marine Conservation. Um, one Health and Zoonotic Diseases, Plastic Pollution, Quantum Information Science and Technology. You see, so our secretary um, has had what he's called the modernization agenda, and that's that's basically trying to push the State Department into today to try to make sure that we have experts and 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 people who can knowledgeably speak on these various topics that we need to engage with an increasingly globalized world. Next slide, please. So other offices and bureaus with an ESTH focus, if you remember ESTH stands for Environment, Science, Technology, and Health. So, so these are the ones that are outside of, of, of OES, of, um, of the Bureau of International Environmental, Oceans and International Environmental Scientific Affairs. Um, so we have the Office of the U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator. They are charged with managing the President's PEPFAR program. So the President's PEPFAR program is the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Um, and they are responsible for implementing that, trying to basically combat AIDS worldwide and reduce the incidences of AIDS everywhere. And then we have a brand new bureau that just started in April 2022, so not even a year old. It's the, the Bureau of Cyber and Digital Policy. And basically they do that. They are responsible for trying to encourage responsible state behavior, state as in nation's behavior in the cyberspace arena. Um, so they're, they're, they're looking at, at stability and security in cyberspace, also promoting digital economy and digital freedom. Okay, so next slide, please. 
All right. Well, uh, thanks very much, Nathan, for that uh, that great overview. One of the reasons that we're very excited to speak to you as an audience is that there are specific professional fellowships that are open uh, to the scientific community. And uh, actually, last week, I participated in an Ask Me Anything uh, with some of these science and technology fellows. Uh, and I was surprised, pleasantly surprised, to learn that uh, right now, the department has 62 of these science and technology fellows uh, who are working on um, projects and, and working in uh, bureaus and offices throughout the Department of State. Um, and so, as you see on this list of, of uh, fellowships that we have available, uh, there is a wide variety of, of options available depending on your experience. The um, the fellowship that, that I've had personal experience with, uh, with working with one of the fellows is the American Association for the Advancement of Science and Technology Fellowship. Uh, the AAAS fellows. And this is probably the fellowship with sort of the, the widest range of eligibility. You uh, have a PhD, or if you're an engineer, you can have an engineering degree and three years of experience. And there's a little bit of matchmaking that happens with all of these professional fellowships. Uh, it's uh, somewhat akin to the internship process that we do with students. We will have bureaus or offices within the department say, I would like to host a science and technology fellow in my office, and then we will submit um, the materials to these different associations to say, we are looking for a material science engineer, or we're looking for a seismologist, or we're looking for a biologist, or we're looking for a specialist in, uh, in AI, uh, and we will uh, put these requests out, and then these different uh, uh, organizations will say, okay, uh, the Department of State is looking to uh, to host a fellow to work on these particular issues. Um, I mentioned that uh, AAAS is, is actually sort of the broadest umbrella here uh, because of the eligibility, eligibility requirements. Most of these fellowships are going to be one-year fellowships uh, where you actually come on board as a civil servant and work in the department on, on the, in the bureau or office that, is, uh, that uh, has selected you. The process for selecting a fellow can be uh, quite lengthy. So we're often looking for applicants in the fall of the year before they're going to do their, their fellowship. And uh, the reason for that is that because you become a civil servant, as Susan was describing earlier, you will often need to get a security clearance in order to be able to do the work that you're doing. You're going to be uh, have access to uh, classified information, um, or might be sitting in meetings where where some of the information is uh, is confidential in nature, um, and so you would submit your paperwork for a, a background investigation in, in addition to your your application. Um, so I talked a little bit about the AAAS fellowship. We also offer the Jefferson Science Fellowship Program, and this is specifically for uh, for professors. Uh, and uh, then folks can do a fellowship with us. AAAS is a very, very broad fellowship that is uh, open across the executive branch and Congress. The Jefferson Science Fellowship Program is exclusive to the Department of State and USAID. We also have uh, engineering and diplomacy fellowships for members who are uh, in the IEEE, the American Institute of Physics and the American Society of Mechanical Engineers actually announced this fellowship um, just last year. And I believe the, um, the application period for this new ASME uh, fellowship might have just uh, come through. So like I said, oftentimes the selection process is going to happen sort of a year in advance uh, just because we will uh, make uh, our proposals within the department We'll put the solicitations out to the, the uh, organizations that are here and uh, fellows apply and then also submit their, their security clearance paperwork as well. And uh, I'll make sure um, that, uh, that you all have links to these, but also if you visit our careers.state.gov uh, page, you'll see that there's a, an actual link for professional fellowships as well that you can visit. And before I turn it over to uh, questions and answers, I talked a little bit about the fact that I am not a 
um, a, an economic officer, but uh, much like Nathan, uh, when I was doing public diplomacy work, a lot of the programs that I was doing to explain our policy to foreign publics uh, involved interacting with, with scientists. So the photo that you see at the left is from 2012. Uh, the U.S. hosted the International AIDS Conference in Washington, D.C., and uh, I, at the time, I was working domestically on an assignment for what's called the Foreign Press Center to help foreign journalists uh, get information from U.S. officials about our, our policy, wide range of policy. And so when the AIDS 2012 conference was being hosted, basically down the street from where my office was in Washington, uh, I actually helped organize a tour to bring journalists from uh, about 30 countries to the United States to talk about our U.S. AIDS policy. Some of these journalists had never been outside their home country uh, before, and uh, they landed in Washington, D.C., and we took them to, to this conference. And that was actually uh, my opportunity to uh, to be in the room with, uh, with Tony Fauci, and he was talking a lot about uh, U.S. AIDS policy. And, of course, the journalists also had the opportunity to talk to the Berlin patient, uh, who was the first person to, to be cured of AIDS, uh, so it was a very, very rewarding experience, uh, and you can see this this sort of uh, this press gaggle that we organized. When I was in Lima, Peru, uh, much like uh, Nathan was describing, we had a very, very large presence of, of scientists who worked for other organizations. So we actually hosted the Naval Medical Research Unit. So the, these were uh, U.S. Navy scientists uh, who served in the military and who deployed and, and were doing research, especially on vector-borne diseases, because if you can imagine uh, the Aedes aegypti, uh, mosquito is able to transmit malaria, but also chikungunya. Um, Zika became a, a big issue when I was in, in Peru uh, and, and other mosquito-borne diseases. So the, this Naval Medical Research Unit provides research to help reduce the incidence of these mosquito-borne diseases to keep our, our, uh, our servicemen and women able to, uh, to, to work and keep them healthy. Um, but we also had a visit by the U.S. Navy Surgeon General. And so this is an infographic of an interview that I arranged for one of the leading newspapers to talk about our uh, our science work and to dispel any misinformation about the Naval Medical Research Unit. And as Nathan also described, um, we will have scientists who work with us in Washington, but we'll also have a presence by entities like the U.S. Navy. The Centers for Disease Control has a large overseas presence and works with us and with our colleagues at USAID as well. Um, so with that, I think uh, I will uh, uh, end our presentation and we'll turn things over to you all for your questions. Before I do, I guess I should I should uh, point out that uh, another big aspect of, uh, of what, why we're engaging with you is because as you can see, we are uh, diplomats from, from different backgrounds and, and uh, who uh, have different experiences. And we're looking for diversity of experience, diversity of ethnicity, diversity of race within the department. Um, so I like to often close my presentations with this quote by the secretary. But with that, I'll stop sharing and we'll turn the floor over to you all for your questions and, and uh, hopefully be able to answer them. I see a hand up from Mark. Are we supposed to say our questions or should we put them in chat? I apologize, I don't know the protocol. There is no, no protocol. Fine. You can go ahead and say your question. Mark. Okay, cool. Also, I didn't realize I'd be wearing the shirt today, but I am from Louisiana. I'm currently Louisiana. in Detroit, but um, I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Anyway, um, I also didn't expect this, but I have been notified that I am a finalist for the Presidential Management Fellowship ah. as of, 1215. So, um, right. so I wasn't just trying to brag, although I am trying to brag. Um, <laughs> you I was curious if you guys had know of um, job opportunities through the, the PMF uh, finalist job board, because I know you guys were listing the, the different um, fellowships. I didn't see the PMF list, listed there, so I wasn't sure if, if that is listed on the job board and if similar opportunities you know are, are there as well, because that's something I would be interested in. I can take that one. Um, I'll start off with that one and let my colleagues chime in. Um, so I was a PMF as well. So you're in good company, um, I think. Uh, I, I started off back in 2004 as a presidential management final fi fellow, presidential management fellow, um, and then later switched over to the foreign service after I passed my foreign service test. 
Yeah, I actually started in the Bureau of East Asia Pacific Affairs doing public affairs, like Saul does that, like a public diplomacy um, career track person. Um, and I remember from when I joined, which of course is like 20 years ago, um, there was a job fair where um, where all of the PMFs were invited to, to because any agency, any executive branch agency were, were, were really trying to hire PMFs, including the State Department. And it's it's PMFs that that go into some of the regional bureaus and even some of the functional bureaus like the um, the OESs and 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 the the Energy Bureau that take on a lot of those civil service positions. So so the PMF just for everybody's knowledge is a graduate student program that you can apply for during your last year of grad school or within two years of graduating. It's a two year elite tracked government tracked program um, that is civil service based. So, so we spoke a lot earlier about the foreign service, but the, the, the PMF is civil service. So it's, it's the folks who will work domestically. Um, and so State Department, of course, does hire as I'm a product of um, PMFs. And, and, they, and, and a lot of the offices, in fact, that I spoke about earlier within OES, which like the Office of Environmental Quality, the Office of, of, of Oceans and Polar Affairs, it's mostly, it, it, they're, they're civil service heavy. So like, for example, my office that I rotated into in my third assignment, there, was, there were five foreign service officers out of 16 people. The, the, the remainder were all civil service. And I believe we did have at least one PMF who was working with us. So all that to say is, yeah, there, there will be a job fair for all of the finalists to go to and State Department will be a part of that. Susan, anything to add? Yeah. I must add, you know, most likely there are going to be some, some scientific positions on there, but we don't really know. You won't really know probably until you're at the job fair and you're looking and see who's, who's looking for someone at the, at the moment. Yeah, it varies year by year. Yeah. Definitely. yeah. Let me address one of the issues in the chat. I see somebody wrote, what things would you suggest current PhD students do to prepare themselves for a career in policy and diplomacy? Um, I think my advice to everyone, really, it's kind of the same advice to everyone, but be curious. So if you're looking to come in as foreign service, the starting point for this is a test. And it is a general knowledge test. And it is very broad. So it's going to cover a little bit of everything. So if you've done your PhD in a very, you know, if you have a scientific um, PhD, you're going to want to expand and know a little bit about you know, U.S. history, uh, politics, economics, literature, culture. It's just a broad knowledge-based test. So if you're the kind of person you're out there, you're reading the media, several different sources, not just one, you're aware of the different issues that are relevant in the world right now. Those are the kinds of things that you want to be doing to prepare yourself for uh, diplomacy or a career in diplomacy. And it'll help you prepare for the test as well. I went ahead and I put a link to the chat that uh, describes the Foreign Service Officer selection process. And uh, there's a question about elaborating on medical clearance, including what is the criteria and testing for clearance entail and what constitutes a non-clearance. So um, the process is basically you take a complete physical uh, at a doctor's office and you submit lab work. Uh, and then those the results of that um, physical and that lab work go back to make a determination about your medical clearance. Um, so historically, uh, the, the requirement for joining the Foreign Service is to be what's called worldwide available, that you, uh, at the end of this uh, these examinations, don't have any condition that will preclude you from serving anywhere in the world, whether that's a place that's high altitude, a place with high pollution, uh, a place where uh, you know certain in, in diseases are endemic. Um, the Department of State recently settled a lawsuit with respect to uh, this requirement because there there were candidates who um, maybe didn't have a, 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 a worldwide avail availability clearance, and uh, they submitted a lawsuit and uh, charging that there was uh, equal employment opportunity discrimination. So the department is is. At this point, kind of, uh, you know, we've settled that lawsuit, and I would expect that uh, we might have a little bit of, of updated guidance in terms of uh, candidates who are otherwise qualified who might, uh, you know, have uh, some some particular condition that 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 might affect their medical clearance. So I would stay tuned. Uh, you know, if you're a candidate who thinks that you might uh, uh, 
have a medical condition that, that might impact your ability to serve in the foreign service, I expect that we'll have uh, updated guidance in the in the months to come. Uh, but uh, but generally, uh, for people who are able to get a, a clearance, you know, the idea is that you could serve in you know high altitude Bolivia or in uh, you know a desert country or a, a you know high uh, humidity country, for example. I see Sasha. You have your hand up. Would you like to go? Yes, hi, thank you so much for your time uh, and for speaking with us, this is very helpful. Um, I wanted to know what were your backgrounds before you joined the State Department and uh, I guess what made you choose a career there? Yeah, I can start with that. I actually uh, was a pharmacy major to start, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, and halfway through the five-year program, I kind of went, I don't think this is for me. Um, I'm, <laughs> I think, I, I'm not sure why I went into science. I think it was one of those things where it seemed like that's kind of what my family wanted me to do. And I realized it really wasn't me. And especially after working for a summer in a pharmacy, I thought, all right, I, I really don't know what to do. <laughs> so I got out, um, I was halfway through my junior year and I looked to see what I could actually still graduate within four years. And that was psychology. And I figured, all right, well, I'll do something after this and I'll figure it out. When I graduated with the psychology degree, I ended up going overseas to teach English. And that was really, because I always kind of wanted to travel, but it wasn't until I got there that I thought, wow, this is fantastic. How do I do this? And so I taught English for a couple of years, kind of floated around Asia for a bit, and I was in Prague. And that was really when I learned about you know, embassies. I had to get pages in my passport. And I went into an embassy and I looked around and I'm like, who are these people and how do they get this job? Because I want to do this, you know, how do you get to work overseas and do that? And so I did go back to school. I got my master's in international relations, but that was only because I didn't have that background and I thought it would be helpful to pass the test. Um, that said, you do not need a master's degree to join the foreign service. You don't need any particular degree in, in, in fact. It doesn't have to be international relations, political science. A lot of people come in with those degrees, but it's not required. If you have a really broad background, work experience, life experience, um, you may be just, it's really about, you know, getting through that test and, and doing good enough on the test to move to the next level. And so if you are well-read and curious and you're out there reading all kinds of things, you don't necessarily need, you know, a background in political science or international relations. How about Saul or Nathan? Sure. Um, I grew up uh, as the son of a, a U.S. Army service member, and um, you know we bounced around from place to place. And we lived for four years in in Germany when I was uh, a teenager, and so that really sort of whetted my appetite for living abroad and experiencing new cultures and, and learning new languages. Uh, and then I, I worked in the private sector for several years and always kind of hoped that my job would send me abroad. And I got the opportunity to, to take a couple of trips overseas, but never the chance to, uh, to, to serve abroad, uh, to work abroad. And then when uh, a friend from college told me that his uh, girlfriend had worked in, in Russia as a foreign service officer and in Switzerland and in Washington, D.C., I thought, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, I, I had always been interested in, in foreign policy. I wanted, uh, you know, I, I was inspired by my dad's example of service, and I really found sort of that that opportunity to uh, to, to really flex those muscles. Um, you get the opportunity to learn foreign languages uh, in the department and get paid to do it. Uh, I haven't really found other opportunities that, that give you that opportunity to 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 sort of. Just be a full-time student and 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 learn and and use those skills when you get uh, deployed overseas, and then this has really been a, a really interesting career. Uh, I don't necessarily have a, an IT background, but you know I sort of stumbled into that. Um, I was interviewing uh, mathematicians and physicists for Fulbright programs uh, in the Republic of Georgia to come to the United States and had an opportunity to to help advance their um, their research, and I thought. You know, sometimes you feel like pinch me. You know, how is it possible that I'm doing something like this? Uh, and, and you know, in two years I'll be doing a different job. I really enjoyed that opportunity. And then mine is kind of like a mix match between both Susan and Saul. So, like Saul, I was a, a military kid. My my parents were both in the army. Um, 
my mom was is from Louisiana, my dad is from Mississippi, but I was raised at, in Fort Polk, Louisiana, which is right by, which is a military base. So I was I was raised in Leesville, right by that military base. But I was born in Germany, so so I had that international experience early on. I started second grade in in Louisiana. Um, then later, when I was in college, I went to Louisiana College, a small Southern Baptist school in Louisiana, and I studied business administration there. And um, my mom encouraged me to study abroad, so I went to do a semester abroad in London. Um, and after that, when I got back to my little small town in Louisiana, I, I couldn't I couldn't stay there any longer. You know, I couldn't stay put. Um, so I went back out and I went like Susan did, taught English in Asia. So I went to teach English in China. And then I um, I was doing my last semester of undergrad in, at Hong Kong, doing another semester abroad at Hong Kong Baptist University. I'm not, I'm not even Baptist, um, I'm Catholic, but uh, I, I was at Hong Kong Baptist University doing, doing it there. And then I saw an advertisement that said, be the face of America to the world, right? And um, it was an advertisement for the State Department. And I was like, well, I was, I was just doing that, you know, out in, I was in Xinjiang, China, which if you know that this is not like Beijing or Shanghai, this is like all the way in the Northwest part of China. So I was, I was the face of America out in that part of the world, especially the African-American face, right? In that part of the world. And um, I was like, I, I could do that for a career. And so like Susan and I started doing the research to figure out how to, how to, how to do it. And I found out all you had to do was take a test to get in. Um, and so I did it. I took the test, didn't get in though. I, um, I, I didn't pass the first time. I, uh, so, so then like Susan, like I said, this is almost exactly like Susan and Sal together. Like I'm there. I'm, I'm the two become one of, the, of them two. Um, so then I went back to grad school and I did a master's in diplomacy and international relations at Seton Hall in New Jersey. And my, my first year of grad school, I took the test again and I passed one part, but I didn't pass the second part. And then my, my last year of grad school, I ended up passing, but I also ended up applying for the PMF, the Presidential Management Fellowship like, like Mark. And that came through first. And that's a real job. So I took that initially. Um, and then after I was a PMF, I had my second part of the test because the test is multi-stage. You take the, the written test first and then you have the oral assessment later. So I had the oral assessment later and I, I passed that and then switched over into the foreign service. Cool. Any other questions? We have a question from Marianne about your foreign language skills impacting your ability, your eligibility as an FSO. Um, and the answer to that is you don't need to speak a foreign language uh, to uh, to go through the Foreign Service Officer Selection process. Once you make it through, as Susan was describing, and you you pass the oral assessment, you get a score. So you might have a very high score, you might have a middle, you know, uh, score or uh, a low score, and it'll tell you, you know, how uh, what the threshold is to to pass. You can take a short uh, phone language test, and if it's in a language like French or Spanish or German, and you do well on that test, you can get, uh, you know, about point one added to your score, and so. Depending on how you scored and how everyone else scored, you might uh, you might go a little bit higher on the register. And we pull people from the top of the register into our orientation classes, and then and then keep working our way down. Uh, if you speak a language like Mandarin or Russian, uh, that is a hard language, you actually get more bonus points. If you're a veteran, you will also get uh, points added uh, to your score. So that's that's the way that that you uh, speaking a foreign language would help you. Uh, and making you a more competitive candidate once you're on the register. And then the question is, um, do changes in the executive branch affect the goals in your job positions? So the overall job doesn't change, but yes, uh, we have served, all of us have served Democratic and Republican administrations, and they might have wildly, wildly different uh, foreign policy positions. And it is our job to, to represent uh, the foreign policy of, of the administration of the president and the secretary of state. So that is one of the things that, that we do emphasize to people that you are representing uh, the, the U.S. government and the executive branch uh, when you serve abroad. 
So um, thank you for answering those questions. Um, in the interest of time, I think that we should wrap up, um, but thank you so much for joining us today and sharing a bit about your careers and career paths at the Department of State. Um, and I think that's, that's about it. Um, thank you again for your time and for working with us. And feel free to reach out to us, uh, diplomats in residence on the careers.state.gov website. We're happy to, to talk to you if you want to follow up at all. All right. All right. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you. Y'all too. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you all.